So thank you all for joining us. I'm Carol Dean, president of From the Heart Production, and these classes are based on the book Producer to Producer by Maureen A. Ryan. She is the co-producer, Academy Award winner for Man on Wire. So before we start the class, I want to share with you a new three-minute video celebrating From the Heart's 30-year anniversary supporting filmmakers with film grants, sponsorship, and all-around good advice. You know, Carol Joyce gives consultations to all of our sponsored filmmakers and those people who apply for our film grants. So this video will give you a good idea of who we are, and I hope you enjoy it. So, Adam, let's play that for us. Our goal is to nurture and support filmmakers and let their creativity soar. You deliver incredible stories that empower, enlighten, and raise our consciousness. From the Heart Productions was created by Carol Dean in 1993 as a nonprofit to support filmmakers. We give individual consultations, educational classes, blogs, and interviews with other successful filmmakers. We started the Roy Dean Film Grant for unique films that make a contribution to society. Our main objective is personal service and guidance for filmmakers. We are proud of the films that we've supported with our Roy Dean Film Grants. If you want a nonprofit fiscal sponsor, please read our benefits and consider From the Heart. If you're making a film, look at our yearly grants for documentaries, features, webisodes, and shorts. We believe independent filmmakers are the most creative artists on the planet. You are magical beings. Thank you, Adam. That's so much fun to look back and see all of those stories because each one, had, there's so much backstory behind every film and it becomes a joy to work with filmmakers uh, in our sponsorship as well as through the grant. So our subject today is production and our instructor is Lorenzo De Stefano and you saw me with him in those pictures. And he's going to share information that he's learned producing films and documentaries and even stage plays. So put your questions in the chat bar and then Adam will ask them for you. Then Robert Siegel, our attorney, will discuss appearance releases, what's included in them and when they should be used, especially for documentaries. So that's our class today. So Adam, would you put up the slide there with Lorenzo so we can all see his bio goes on and on. So we had to cut it down for you. But I want to introduce you to Lorenzo because he's uh, an artist, extraordinary, extraordinary artist. Uh, he um, has done almost everything. Uh, there's nothing that 
in the art field. He's into all of it. So uh, we're just really lucky to have him. He did Stairway to the Stars, which I really love. It's a short film with two A-list actors. That in itself is uh, a feather in anyone's cap in producing. And he's got his narrative feature, the upcoming feature, Shipment Day. And he's worked on many docs and other films. So he has a lot of experience on set and preparing to get on set. So um, I'm going to turn this over to you, Lorenzo. Thank you very much for joining us and sharing with us. Happy to be here. Thanks, Carol. Um, hello, everybody. Um, yeah, well, you know, this ruminating as to how to encapsulate a lot of my experiences and to benefit you the most in terms of your own journey as filmmakers. Um, we can go through the specific films <clears throat> in a bit, but I think in general, I wanted to just touch on what I would call tales from the street. You know, uh, there's a lot of theoretical aspects to trying to impart what, what it takes to be uh, in this business art form, whatever you want to call it, over the long term. Um, everybody really wants to be a director and that's fine, but uh, I always, you know, temper that with, what, do you understand what it takes to really be in that chair for a long period of time? Um, to to have resilience and the stamina it takes to believe in something, let's in storytelling in a particular story, when no one really cares but you. Uh, that happens a lot. Um, not everyone gets everything done, even the great filmmakers leave a lot of stuff behind uh, uh, that they weren't able to pull off um, and we all know stories of that so coming down from the heights to the real world where where most of us live uh, it's the same rules apply whether you have huge uh, pull in the industry or not you're never going to get everything done so that it kind of evens the field out a little bit uh, and and imparts a kind of uh, uh, knowledge, uh, um, awareness as to what it takes to continue uh, in this world is a real participant in it, not a poser or, a, you know, there's a lot of talkers out there. Uh, there's a lot of followers. There's very few leaders. So if you want to be a leader, you have to start with yourself and choosing projects that not only resonate with you, but you feel will resonate <clears throat> with an audience. I'm not talking about commercial uh, risk reward factors that, that business people rely on to before they start a business. It's, this is different in that sense. You have to kind of put that aside in terms of how many people will watch it and so on. Um, but is it going to resonate culturally, societally with what's going on now? And what's going to be going on in two or three or four or five years between <laughs> conceiving of these things? and when they may be actually become real, you know. Um, so um, I started off, I'm from Honolulu, Hawaii originally, and I started as a street photographer uh, in high school. It sort of began framing the world through through that. And uh, of course I was interested in films like a lot of people. And I became an apprentice to a filmmaker in Hawaii for a couple of years. And from him, I learned um, that kind of, passion you know that it takes to to really get into this uh format of, of expression um i wanted to be a film editor uh from an early age uh i watched the movie cabaret 14 times at the cinerama theater on king street in honolulu it was really the first movie that i saw that where editing seemed to stand out as not just assembling shots but telling story and uh, that film won an Oscar for editing for an editor named David Bretherton, who I later got the privilege to meet. But that set me on a path of film editing, which is, I think, fundamental to everything I've done since. Um, I, I went to L.A. Uh, I got in the union eventually. I worked for National Geographic for a couple of years, and then I got in the union and worked on features, <clears throat> including Blue Lagoon was one of my early films as an apprentice. And and work my way up to to a film editor over a period of about five years 
So I was in that business, that aspect of the business for a good many years. I cut about a dozen features myself. And then I got onto a, a television series at Warner Brothers called Life Goes On, <clears throat> a, an ABC drama uh, starring Patti Lapone. And uh, that was a fundamental change for me from an editor. I was a supervising editor on that. And then I began climbing up the producer ladder on that show, and I eventually directed for them and got in the Directors Guild. So that was a transition from post-production into production. Uh, it, uh, it happens if you get in lucky enough to get on a show like that. This was a, a single camera drama shot on film. So there were like 83 episodes we did over four seasons. They were all mini movies, you know, with the rotating cast of directors. Uh, of which I became one. And uh, so that was a great launching pad for me to have the confidence to go out and develop my own material, you know. Um, <clears throat> I wrote all during that time uh, and uh, honed my skills, a lot of projects that never happened, but that were good uh, learning uh, curve in terms of ad adaptations of plays and novels and so forth. So um, the documentaries uh, are, uh, particular interest, I think, today, because uh, this is what we're talking about, uh, though we're going into some narrative projects of mine as well. Uh, Talmadge Farlow was the first film I made. I was a, basically a failed guitar player, and I had thought I'd make a film about one of my guitar heroes, a man named Tal Farlow, who was uh, a big guitarist in the 50s. And uh, I got to meet Tal, and, and I pitched him an idea about doing the film. And he initially politely rejected the idea and says, I don't know what what's the point. Why am I special? I don't understand. And I said, well, let me, if I can get the money, thanks, Adam, for putting that up. If I can get the money, uh, I'll come back to you and maybe you'll reconsider. So I think to his surprise, I did find some money and uh, we filmed this. And Tal Farlow's a remarkable character. He's, he's gone now, but he... Um, embodied for me, not just artistic excellence, musical excellence and innovation, but a real calm and, and thoughtful man who was also a sign painter, uh, who left the scene at, the, at his, the height of his powers in the late 50s and to live a quiet life on the Jersey shore in New Jersey and paint signs and give lessons and catch fish and you know, it was about a philosophy of life as much as it was about music. So uh, that film did very well. It was, a, it was the biggest film I'd ever done, a one-hour film for PBS, and um, still around. Um, we can talk later about not just making these films, but keeping them in distribution is a big part of the job of a filmmaker. I mean, you'll have relationships with distributors, which will be variable from the horrible to the excellent. and um, But it's your job primarily to keep those films out there, just like it would be for an author to keep their book in print, um, because it's easier now to get these things seen on all the platforms that are available. But it still takes a lot of work and conscientious follow through to keep these films available um, on DVD, which is a little less uh, of a format now, but certainly streaming. So this film went out and, and was in the London Film Festival uh, and a bunch of other festivals it aired on A&E Network and so on. So it was a learning experience for me and uh, it kind of launched me into that long form uh, documentary field. Um, we can go to the Zephyros one, I think now, Adam. This was my second uh, feature documentary that was shot in 2001 in Cuba and in, in Miami. Uh, I had been going to Cuba since 1993, taking photographs and uh, encountered this group, the Sapphires, Los Zafiros, uh, which I did not know about, um, a very important pop group in Cuba, not like Buena Vista Social Club, it's more traditional Cuban music. Los Zafiros was, was basically a doo-wop, R&B influenced group uh, very American undertones with uh, the, the Four Tops, the Temptations, the Platters, groups like that. Um, 
so I became fascinated by them. And then when I found out there were two surviving members of this group, Miguel Cancio and Manuel Galvan, I set about, about a one-year process of getting to know their families, getting to know them, and getting permission from the parties to make this film. Uh, what Robert will be talking about later is releases, and I had to get those, of course, for from Farlow, of course, before that, from everyone involved in that film, uh, and from these people in Los Afiros. Um, I had uh, assistant directors in Cuba who, to help the language barrier. I spoke enough Spanish to get by, but not enough to really be, uh, you know, able to converse or to do the interviews in a fluid way. So I had a lot of help along the way. Uh, this film uh, was supported by a lot of people in Cuba. Uh, we found a lot of great archival footage of this group. It's a much loved group. Uh, and I was honored to be able to make the film because it's a Cuban story. And usually that would be reserved for a Cuban filmmaker. Um, but they allowed me in. And uh, a year after we shot it, we premiered it at the Havana Film Festival, which was great. I mean, people came up to me and said you gave us our youth back and they cried and it was an extremely emotional story about the return to cuba of of miguel cancio after many years to see his old partner manuel galban those two guys sit, uh, standing in the lower right and uh, all the places and pl places and people they knew uh it's extremely nostalgic it covers the the early days of the cold war between kennedy and Castro uh, and the Cuban Missile Crisis. But overall, it's a story of five guys who came together to create really beautiful music, which is uh, out there for you to hear anytime you like. Um, so uh, we can go on to the next one, which is uh, Hearing is Believing. This was released in 2017 uh, about a fantastic musician composer named Rachel Flowers who you see there. Rachel, I met in 2014 when she was 20. She just turned 30. That's another aspect of these projects is you become part of the people's lives, you know. Uh, unlike narrative films where you come together and make the film and then depart, uh, sometimes with acrimony, <laughs> you know, sometimes not. Um, these documentaries are really uh, relationship builders in a lot of ways. If you connect with the subject, which you must in order to tell an honest story, uh, that lasts a long time. Farlow and I were friends for 20 years after the movie. I was the best man at his wedding. When he died, he left me one of his guitars. I'm still in touch with with Manuel, uh, with Miguel Cancio, who's the only surviving Los Aferos. We talk every couple of months, done radio interviews together. Rachel Flowers and her family I just spoke to the other day. So these kinds of things are relationship projects as well as film projects. Um, Rachel was born blind uh, due to 15 weeks premature uh, in 1993. She just turned 30 and she's uh, a force in the music business, um, a real creator, you know, uh, someone who triumphed over huge obstacles. So I was much uh, attracted to the story behind it, the story of her mom, Jeannie, uh, the family, a uh, single mom with two kids and um, working paycheck to paycheck, to supporting uh, two very talented young people in the house. Um, so this film's done very well out there. It's still in distribution. It's on Amazon Prime and a lot of other uh, platforms. Um, so this, and it was very close to home. Rachel lives about 20 minutes from me in Southern Central California. So this was the third uh, music film that I did. And uh, it played a lot of festivals, won some awards, and basically uh, was a great joy to be part of because Rachel is so deserving of attention. Um, I think all these projects uh, made and unmade of mine share several things. One, the main thing being they are interested in people who would otherwise be overlooked in the general push of 
media and uh, obsession with headline grabbers and people with big voices and small ideas. I'm looking for people with big ideas and small voices because they, uh, the secret is there uh, in terms of that's more relevant to most of us. Uh, so uh, anyway, we can go to the next slide if we like. This is the film Carol mentioned. This was uh, uh, fiscal sponsored by From the Heart Productions. This is Stairway to the Stars, uh, a 25 minute narrative short. I hadn't made a narrative film in many years. And uh, this was a story that I actually experienced when I first moved to Hollywood. Uh, I lived near a stairway uh, up by Beechwood Canyon where the Hollywood sign is. And I uh, overheard one day, a, an older lady and a young guy arguing on their way up the stairs, berating each other. It was a fascinating uh, experience. And I listened from my window, I, I watched them, and I wrote down what they said. Uh, and they disappeared, I never saw them again. Um, I was in my late twenties, I thought I'm gonna make a film about this. I wrote the script, it was called Westshire Drive at the time, and I never made the film. A couple of years ago, I found the script in storage and I rewrote it. And it was uh, produced as a play in Honolulu, uh, directed by someone else. And they sent me the tape and uh, I thought, well, there's something there. Uh, so I decided then to get the film made finally with, I had more skills at that point. And, and I had been friends with Sean Young's sister for many years, Kathleen Young, and she suggested her sister maybe for the part we sent it to Sean, who many of you probably remember from Blade Runner and Dune and No Way Out and Ace Ventura, lots of films. She's still working. She's still out there. Wonderful woman, a real trooper. Um, so she agreed to do it and agreed to play a woman older than her, which is not easy for an actress to, to do. Uh, and then we got Quentin Aaron, who you see on the right there. Quentin was the co-star with Sandra Bullock in the film uh, Blind Side. He played Big Mike. And, uh, you know, I wanted it to be a biracial story. Um, in Hawaii, it was done with an Asian woman and a Hawaiian guy. So that kind of got me thinking about the dynamics of the piece, this love-hate relationship between this couple, this very odd couple. Uh, so that film is out there, uh, Stairway to the Stars film.com. You can check out the trailer and some of the other elements of the project. Uh, that's done quite well. It was released in August of 22 uh, and it's just finishing up its festival run. We've got a bunch of awards and um, it's about to start streaming. So it was very gratifying to take a true story adapted for film, find the team together to make it. it was shot over a four day period in LA with a, a, a tight crew shot on 4K digital and, uh, and edited over a period of about five to six months and then released. Um, you know, you make these films, you put them out there and then you find out whether you were onto something or not, whether the, the world reacts to what you've done or completely ignores it. So it's nice when the work is not ignored, you know. Um, I guess maybe we'll take a few, if there are any questions before moving on to some of the other projects, uh, which are upcoming projects, is there anyone who wants to uh, have any questions? If not, I'll continue. No questions yet, but if anyone has any, go ahead and put them in the chat. Let me say, um, yeah, go ahead. I, I really love this idea about resonating with your audience. Um, I'm a big uh, fan of Save the Catch and, uh, the author of one of my favorite books on screenwriting. What he would do, Lorenzo, when he got an idea for a film, he tested it out on his audience. He would create a short pitch, go down to the coffee shop, the grocery store, any place where he found an audience and start pitching his film to get an audience reaction and see if people got interested or liked what he had to say. And he found that those people who responded 
the most allowed him an insight into that market saying to him that, yes, you have a saleable film, go for it. So I think that's really important when you talk about it has to resonate with the audience. This screenwriter started his film that way. You know, I've done the same thing uh, just with stories, talking to people about what do you, you know, not necessarily soliciting them for approval, but saying, are they starting to nod off, you know, or are they actually interested in, in this tale? And each time you tell it, this is without any visuals. This is just, it was just say in Hawaii, talk story, you know, talking story. Um, you hone your, your project that way. You know, you become, you hear your own voice, you change it, you, you alter it, you become second nature. I think the idea here is, is to have the project speak through you and you speak through the project. Um, there's, there's a very thin veil. There's no firewall at all. It's, it becomes who you are, you know, and relationships may come and go in your life. Economic factors kick in, you're up, you're down, you're sideways. But meanwhile, you always have these stories. And that's what I admire about storytellers in any medium, as painters, poets, whatever, is is this resilience. Uh, and it gets old after a while. You know, you see, it's very, very center focused on yourself, which can get a little old. But if you can go through yourself to these other stories about other people, whether they're nonfiction or created and created characters, um, you become a conduit, you know? So it's not like you, you know, obviously you have filmmakers like Michael Moore who are right up front on the films and that's a different kind of filmmaking. You have Ken Burns, who's somewhat more distant in the background. He has his style, which has worked very successfully for him. Um, but then there's disappearing act, you know, the filmmaker uh, whose presence is only felt in the choices that they're making in terms of how they're editing the film and how they're showing the film. That's sort of the, the school that I'm in. And, um, you know, it works for me. Uh, I don't know how, how I do in, in the other uh, style, but, uh, you know, this is what I've chosen to do is, is to explore stories this way, you know. So Carol, you're right. You, you need to not keep these too close to the vest because um, then you're working in a vacuum. Yes. Yes, you can't really be doing that. You're doing this for for the audience. I mean, it's your story, and you want to tell it. So sometimes it's how you tell the story. You may be pitching it wrong. So that's what he found that he would have to go back and redo his pitch, and sometimes that engaged the audience. But I also I watched this doc called uh, Sly. It's about Stallone. And mm -hmm. in there, in the beginning, he talks, shows us pictures of his script and Lorenzo. You won't believe how many things he crossed out and what all he wrote on the side. I mean, it was an amazing process of how he created his script. It wasn't just an immediate thing. A lot of people tell me, oh, I just channeled my script. I'm not going to change a word. Well, a lot of our greatest films came from... Uh, rewrites and rewrites and scratching out and so how did you do that with your scripts well you know the documentaries don't have scripts per se they basically have outlines of the scenes you want to cover after you've done your research or while you're doing your research things pop up in the case of Zephyros liner notes revealed certain story elements talking with the family revealed certain things and then your job is to pick and choose what you're going to actually take the time to film be it in interviews or when you know when you're filming in cuba and again i was familiar with cuba when i started this movie so um but it revealed itself in such amazing ways you turn a camera on in cuba and you're bound to get some great things um and then when you center it on a story like that which everyone is familiar with over there you really have something um Stairway to the Stars, as I told you, the process was a true story, one act play, movie. Um, and when we cast these two actors, um, we started rehearsals over Zoom. Uh, Sean was in Atlanta and Quentin was in New Orleans. And we 
we went through the script and then when they came to LA prior to the shoot, we put them in the same hotel. Um, this film was executive produced by the way, by Carol Joyce, who is your daughter, who was extremely in instrumental in helping to pull this together. Um, Thank you. It, it won the, uh, the first Roy Dean grant in 2021 for narrative short, which was a great springboard for which I'm very grateful. Uh, to give me encouragement to go and make the film. Um, but then we started rehearsing. We took them to the location so they could see that this was not an easy shoot. These are 260 steps <laughs> outside. No green screen. You had to actually sweat uh, to make this film. We all worked very hard. Um, and then they had a chance to tailor the script to their own voices, their own talents. And I was there adjusting lines it wasn't it wasn't fundamentally changing it but to sean would say what about this or what if i said that and uh it was great process and so that made them feel more part of it you know it wasn't you know, they were paid and uh, way below what they would normally make but i wanted them to feel part of this story I wanted them to inhabit these two characters laverne and tony it wasn't sean anymore it was laverne it wasn't Quentin anymore, it was Tony. And by in, involving them in the script, allowing them in, instead of keeping it so close to yourself, that's yeah. often a sign of insecurity, you know, when you're, when you're trying to control it too much. If, if they sense that you're open and comfortable with their involvement, they sense your experiences there, you, you have the right intentions, and uh, they deliver. I th they being actors in, in this case beyond what what they normally would on any kind of a job you know uh so anyway that was the process you know that i went through well adam did you have some questions yeah lorenzo we have a question from nancy Can you talk about how you go about contacting investors phone email or what's your experience with best practice for reaching out to investors well we kidnapped them <laughs> and lock them in a room and then force them to watch and, and pay attention. That's a that's a difficult question, uh, a fundamental one. Um, I've been lucky to have a group of supporters over the years uh, for a lot of my efforts, people who could afford a thousand here, 500 there, sometimes larger. Uh, Stairway to the Stars enjoyed that for sure, um, along with the support from, from the Heart Productions. There were about a dozen uh, investors uh, in the film. Everyone knew it was a short, so there was going to be no return, really. Um, so uh, I've gone back to the well several times with people. You have to time that carefully because these are not super wealthy individuals. These are people who 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 want to help you, uh, but you have to mix it up. You can't go to the same people too often, you know. Um, in terms of larger projects. It's very problematic, you know. Um, one of the projects we'll talk about a little later, Shipment Day, is an adaptation of a play of mine that's a about a $3 million movie to be made in Hawaii, a historical family drama. Very tough to find that money, especially without big stars. So I would answer that question to say it's an intuitive process. You have to kind of align the investor with the subject, whether it's geographical, Let's say a project takes place in Hawaii. You try to find investors in Hawaii. That doesn't always line up. Uh, tax credits, various things like that. Um, you know, there's this uh, 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 Largo AI, which Carol has been involved with, which is uh, trying to find ways to get investors' confidence by analyzing scripts and so forth. It's a very complex and tenuous process to find and keep investors you know so I, I hope that sort of answers the question it's difficult it's it's not about dreaming at that point that's the hard that's the, the hard part that's the real reality is can you fund these dreams you know right well uh and keep them that's the key uh when you keep your investors close to you uh, and you do that, I guess, through phone calls, just updating or emails to let them know what you're doing and what you're working on, right? 
Right. So some some people are more reluctant than others to become engaged. Some don't want to, you to share their names with others because then they become inundated with requests, right. whether it's family, friends or relatives or whatever. I mean, there's many stories out there. There's the credit card movies. There's, you know, all of that. Um, but, yeah, you have to engage and and feel this is part of the intuitive process, feel uh how much engagement they want, but make it available to them. Not, it's not only about on-screen credit, which some investors don't want, you know, for, for their own reasons. A offering executive producer credits, co-producer credits, different levels, crowdfunding, all of that. I've done all of those things uh, with varying degrees of success, but I've always found that it's the people who, who know and trust me to deliver that become the more um, reliable investors, the, the more trusted investors. Uh, so you have to cultivate in an honest way. You, you know, you can't just take people's money and for granted. They worked hard for that, and you have to assure them you're going to work hard to make that money go as far as it can. So it's kind of a mutual. Uh, it's a relationship, you know. Right. You, they have to like you and trust you. That's the key. So sometimes it can take months to uh, woo a donor, uh, someone who would love to be part of your film, but is unsure. It just takes time to get them across that trust and likability area. But the more they see your dedication, the easier it is for them to want to be part of your project. Right. Yeah, and of course you share as the project takes hold. Obviously a narrative film, you need to have the money together before you go and shoot it. A documentary you can start putting together without any money. If you get an editor or if you are an editor, you start doing show reels or trailers, or which helps to give an idea of what this is going to be. Um, that video that that uh, helped to produce for From the Heart has a lot of films on there that are are made, but there's also films that are just trailers now, concepts, and they all have their own journey, you know, um, and they're all putting it out there to become realities. And some will become that, some won't. Uh, but you know what, from the heart does a little, a little uh, testimonial here to from the heart is gives you the encouragement that your project is worth pursuing, you know whether you get an award from them or fiscal sponsorship or benefit from these webinars and other things. Uh, it's about building up confidence, you know, that you can actually do this. Um, when you've done this for a while, like I have, the confidence is not as much of a factor. You have the confidence, but you're not, there's certainly never a guarantee that your confidence is going to turn into a finished film. Each time you set out, it's a different journey, a hazardous one, uh, but full of rewards if you stick it out, you know? All right. We well, can go to the next one if you, uh, unless Carol, you sorry, you had to say something. Right. Uh, go ahead, Adam. Uh, no other questions in the chat yet. Okay. Okay. We'll go to the next slide. All right. Okay, so these the, the films you saw were have all been produced and released. These next few slides are films that are upcoming. Um, I mentioned briefly Shipment Day. This is the independent feature in Hawaii. I'm from Hawaii originally. This is a story about my cousin, Olivia. Uh, a story I only really discovered in my family when I was in my late 30s. I found out that my mom's cousin, Portuguese woman named Olivia, had been diagnosed with leprosy at the age of 18 in 1930s Honolulu. And uh, she had written a book called My Life of Exile in Kalaupapa. Kalaupapa being the famous leprosy settlement on Molokai, where a lot of people with leprosy have been sent starting in the 1860s until today. It's sort of on the, on the decline now, but it's only you know, very six patients left there now. But Olivia was sent there in her early 20s uh, and lived there for about 70 years oh. till she was 90. Uh, 
And uh, so I met Olivia and became part of her life for about 17 years. And I wrote this play after she died in 2006. Uh, uh, several years passed, uh, maybe almost nine, eight or nine years before I wrote the play as a one act. And it was done in LA. It was done in Honolulu. It picked up a couple of awards as a one act play. And then it was commissioned as a full length play by the Hawaii Performing Arts Company. And it premiered as a play in uh, November of 2018 and did very well. It's it's gonna be uh, premiering in Lisbon, Portugal later this year in a Portuguese English bilingual production. So it has some legs as a, as a theater piece, uh, but the idea of making it into a, a low budget film somewhere in the $3 million range um, uh, took hold and I've written the script and it's out there. We've, we've gathered a lot of crew people in Hawaii who are interested in working with it, uh, with us on it. Um, but the task of finding that much money, low budget as it is, is a huge task. I mean, Hawaii has a 22% tax credit, which is helpful, but, um, you know, you need to elevate the project beyond something you dream of doing to a, a, an actual commercial venture, you know, something that's not going to, if you find someone with 3 million to spare, great. <laughs> but, or two people with 1.5, whatever it ends up being, or or four people with 750 each, whatever it takes, um, it's a tall order, but you still have to keep that dream alive, you know. Um, and so, you know, posters, this poster was done by a friend of mine, David Bird, who did, did some posters for me for some plays I did in the 80s. Uh, David's a fantastic illustrator uh, who's who started doing a lot of rock posters for uh, for Bill, Bill Graham, Fillmore East, Fillmore West. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a great poster, I think. I mean, it's, yes. you know, it's it, it conveys that sense of past time with the crinkled parchment. There's a rendition of Olivia there. There's the suitcase. There's the target around her head because she was uh, basically arrested for having this condition and taken away from her family. So it's a very emotional story, uh, a great story. And it happens to be a family story, uh, which was an honor, you know. Um, as far as the continuing relationship I talked about with documentaries, here's one. Uh, Olivia made me her executor. So when she died, uh, I became her executor. So I'm, I'm kind of uh, involved in keeping her book in print. We put out a new edition in 2018. The play, the film, it's all part of an effort to remind the world uh, that Olivia Robello Bretha was a very important woman uh, who was, I call her the Rosa Parks of leprosy in a sense that you know, Rosa Parks, the the housekeeper who wouldn't get off the bus, who has become an iconic figure in civil rights movement. Olivia, not as historically huge as as Rosa Parks, but but for me and for many others, also uh, emblematic of that kind of uh, individuality, that questioning authority uh, of people who've been oppressed. You know. So there's racial oppression, there's medical oppression in, in Olivia's case. So I see her as a big figure, you know. Um, my involvement with her is extended now to a, a memoir that I wrote called Visitations, Finding a Secret Relative in Modern Day Hawaii, which is just picked up a publisher, will be coming out later this year. So my involvement with Olivia is multifaceted, you know, from the play to the film to this memoir. And, um, I feel she's worth the attention. Uh, so we'll see how the, the film does. I tend to bounce between film and theater and fiction or nonfiction because if I have a story to tell, I'm not gonna wait around for the money to tell it. I'm gonna tell it one way or the other in uh, whatever medium I can manage. So uh, that's kind of the strategy which isn't always worked out in fine detail, but 
the idea is that whole idea of you have to become a junkie for story. You have to become an addict for story. So instead of shooting junk into your arm, you're shooting stories <laughs> here into your arm and then translating those for the public. Uh, it's, it has the same kind of hazards of being a, a druggie, a drug addict, you know, but in this case, you're a story addict and uh, people will sometimes tire of you for your resilience and your, your persistence, but it's all you have really, it's who you are. It's who you are, but it's your focus. You have to stay totally focused on these things to keep them alive. So congratulations yeah. on achieved. You do. Uh, we can go to the next one, Adam, and then we'll run through these so that Robert can jump in. Okay, now this is uh, from a darkened room. This is a new documentary. Uh, it's actually the first documentary I've, I will have done that's not musical in nature. Uh, this is based on the Inman Diary, which is a very famous diary uh, published by Harvard University Press in the mid 80s, written by Arthur Crewe Inman, uh, uh, a very strange eccentric in Boston who, who wrote this 17 million word diary over a 60 year period. It's a project I've been involved with since those days, um, unofficially and then officially having the rights to, these, to this diary from Harvard University Press since the late 90s. Uh, Harvard just extended my option four days ago, January 1st, the 16th option. It's unbelievable how long I've been involved in this. Um, but I became fascinated by Arthur Inman's story and his wife, Evelyn, who lived in an apartment in Back Bay, Boston, that still, that still exists, the building Garrison Hall, uh, who from the 1920s until his death in 63, were paid people through personal ads and so on to come up and talk to Arthur and become part of his diary, part of his world. He seldom left his apartment, so he brought the world into his apartment. And uh, his diary, which was unpublished in his lifetime, has over a thousand characters. So it covers a 60 year period from his youth in Atlanta, Georgia, to his transplanting to New England. Uh, it's a story of a marriage a very strange and modern marriage. Uh, and uh, so it's, um, I, I wrote it as a play and, and to kind of get a handle on it dramatically. Uh, the play was called Camera Obscura, which in Latin means dark room, darkened room. Uh, it was produced uh, at a workshop at Seattle Repertory Theater and then had a world premiere at the Almeida Theater in London, um, both directed by Jonathan Miller. Uh, a wonderful stage and opera director, now deceased, who uh, took this project of mine and really made it sing, you know, uh, and cast it, put it together. I learned a lot from Jonathan. Um, I always wanted to make a film about it. Um, I was involved with the, the great English actor, John Hurt, who many of you know from Elephant Man and Midnight Express and many, many films. Uh, white mischief uh, to do a, a feature, a two hour feature with me directing and with John starring as Arthur. And uh, we could not get funding for that film, believe it or not, with even with John Hurt, um, even with uh, uh, William Morris behind it, the agency and so on. Uh, so John died in 2017. I rethought the project and it's now uh, out there as a five-part limited series called The Diarist. And it's not something I'll be directing because it's too big of a project really for me to be approved for. So I'm a producer writer on it and I have the underlying rights. That's a project that's looking for, well, there it is, looking for a director and showrunner producers to help make that happen. And of course the cast. So uh, this is, these are two different outgrowths of the same source material, both from a darkened room, being a documentary that I'm uh, launching, which is a fiscally sponsored project by From the Heart. Again, I should mention that. Um, 
because I may never get this limited series made. It's a big, it's a big ambitious project. So my thought is that I should at least get the documentary made for a lot less money, under 300,000 thereabouts, uh, because that may end up being the ultimate film. You know, you can't count on these big dream projects coming through. So again, I'm covering my bases here with two different, uh, this was a film, it was a play, it was an opera. I was approached by a composer, can we turn this into an opera? So they used my play as a basis for an opera called The Inman Diaries, which was produced in Boston. And then the documentary, the feature, and now the limited series. So this reflects probably more than any other project I've done over 30 something years of, of believing, you know, that this was important. Uh, it's sort of backed up by the fact that the, the Inman Diary is a published piece. It's had great reviews. It's seen as almost a uh, iconic work in the field of, of diaries, one of the longest diaries ever written and one of the more fascinating. So I'm not on my own there. There's there's Harvard University, it's press, there's, there's uh, ample evidence that this is an important subject, even though it's a, a diary of a nobody. You know, the, the way of, the way I'm framing this as a relevant piece for where we are today, as we refer to Arthur as the original blogger. If if Arthur was alive now, he'd have a podcast, he'd be all over <laughs> this, this communication explosion that's going on. Right. And he'd be interviewing people, uh, he'd be ever present. Um, and so that's the, the way into understanding what is a kind of an archaic version a guy who was into connectivity before that was even a word, you know, um, the, the tagline being before there was Facebook, before there was social networking, there was Arthur Inman. Um, That's great. I know that, you know, from the heart talks a lot about taglines, log lines. That's a good one, you know, <laughs> and it's important to be able to frame for people in a very brief way what this thing is about, you know. Well, you should be really honored that Harvard has stuck with you, they believe in you, and they understand that this is a hard thing to fund. It's unique. Yeah, so I, I, I like to, I've been through several regimes there and they all seem to stick with me, which is amazing. Uh, I like to think it's because I'm so, so cool, but really it's about, I'm the only guy crazy enough to <laughs> want to make this. <laughs> right now so let's be realistic you know um but yeah they do you know and i keep again they're like investors you know they're a publisher they could be selling this to someone else i don't know who would get involved in it hopefully they would buy my script and and uh, go from there but um they are investors whether they give you cash or in this case options um that are reasonable or often free depending they become investors, so you must keep in touch with them. You must not disappear on them. Right. You must treat them as partners and not over, not, you know, that's that fine line between communicating too much with people and communicating too little. You have to find that perfect match, you know, of what, so I keep them informed. And right. the documentary is a way for me to keep the project alive, you know, to say, hey, I'm doing this now. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, got an editor involved and raising money to pay the editor to start it's basically a post-production job because the materials all exist you know there's there's very little shooting involved it's an it's a massive editorial project which we're hoping to be finished and submitting to festivals in the fall um so, so adam i think we have what one more slide yeah so concluding with this upcoming project. This is Houseboy. Uh, I uh, published my first novel last year called Houseboy, a true story based on uh, with the modern slavery theme. I'd been fascinated by modern slavery and what the hell is going on with slavery is still around. And I was in, in London for a reading of a, a per earlier play of mine, and I found a piece in a newspaper about a young man from India who... Um, was tried and convicted of murder 
for killing a woman who was his captor, his slave master uh, in North London, in the suburbs of London. A woman who was uh, also Indian, but of a different caste, an upper caste, uh, and her son who basically illegally brought the young man uh, into into England. He was a he was a Dalit, an untouchable, a low caste Indian, who got caught up in a in an employment scam uh, to bring young people, young servants, basically, to England, with the promise of 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 employment and payment. They could send home money. Of course, in many cases, it became captivity. Uh, what was interesting to me is that, you know, we've all been inundated with stories of human trafficking and so on and sex trafficking and i think the danger there is becoming apathetic about evil in the world and and then evil prospers when you become apathetic about it you got to really stay on on target about what's going on in the world whether you can do anything about it or not so i felt i could tell this story uh about a young man who was sexually uh trafficked by a woman, which is a flip side of what's usually the case. And uh, anyway, Houseboy was published by Atmosphere Press in 22, and it's done critically very well. And uh, it's uh, also, a, again, like like the Inman Project, it's, it's out there as a play. And now it's also planned and written as a five-part limited series similar to The Diarist. So this is, again, the same basic material. In this case, I own the material since I wrote the novel, um, so I don't have to option it from anyone. But trying three different mediums, uh, in addition to an audio book we're planning, which would be recorded in India, in English, uh, to take the same story and, and use the different uh, uh, mediums that are available to share this, what I think is an important story uh, about survival, about a young man who survives horrendous cir circumstances and, and comes out of it, not unscathed, but alive. Well, did they uh, prosecute him? Did he go to jail for murder? He did. He did. His, he, he was, it was, I won't give away the, the details of the murder, but it was rather ghastly. And yet it was mitigated by the fact that what came out at trial was the fact that he was a captive, but he was hugely mistreated. So the charge was reduced uh, with the help of a very prominent uh, QC, a, a, an attorney uh, in England, from capital murder to what they call in England manslaughter with provocation. So the charge was reduced. He was sentenced to four years. Uh, and he began serving that term. Um, I arranged to meet the real guy who was in prison, in Brixton Prison in South London. And he gave his permission. I was looking to maybe do an article at the time, a, a journalism piece about his experiences. And he agreed to meet with me uh, through his, his solicitor. And uh, the day before I was scheduled to meet him in prison, he was deported back to India. Oh, no which was one of the terms of his sentence, that so he could be deported. And so he disappeared. I never found him, never got to speak with him. But the story be, kind of continued to, to affect me. That's that whole junkie thing. You know, this story would not go away. And so basically between, I hate to tell you, but between reading that article in the newspaper in London in 1995 and the book coming out in 2022, that's 27 years between hearing about something. I mean, I didn't work on it every day or, you know, I did other things in between, but that's the kind of longevity, the kind of arc that you need to be able to um, withstand that kind of neglect, that kind of solitary pursuit of something. And uh, luckily it, it got published and it's out there. So we'll see. It had to be good. I I uh, think you're underestimating all of this. What you've taught us today is that a story has many windows and don't just get 
focused on one. I mean, what a great idea to take an idea an idea and then create a script, work it out on stage and then take it to film. This is a very smart also to take it to an audio book, a book. There are so many things that you can do with the story that you have. So don't get stuck on the only idea to get your point across or your story across is through a doc or a feature because there are so many other ways that you can share your story. That's wonderful. Thank you, Lorenzo. You're welcome. Yeah, not every story will have that opportunity, but to, to road test it, I mean, theater is a familiar medium for me, and that's a great way to road test this material, whether it's a one act or a full length play, um, to, to, to see before you take the deep dive into funding and everything else, is their audience going to re relate to it? So it's it's beyond going to the coffee shop and talking to your friends about it. It's actually putting it in front of an audience. So um, thank you. So far, so good. I'm just doing what comes natural, and um, there's no guarantees. Well, one question that came up is very important that because every one of your posters has been most impressive, like Houseboy. Uh, the, you can see the tropical stuff in the front, the, the beautiful sky, and then a scary house, a haunted or mm -hmm. affected house. So you know it's an interesting story from looking at it. And someone was asking about your posters. All of them that we've seen are storytelling posters. So do you put a lot of attention into the poster and when do you get it made? Those are two good questions for you. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's, it becomes an emblematic image, whether it's the final poster or not. In in the case of Houseboy that you're looking at now, that's an artist's rendering of an actual photograph I took on the street where this all happened. A street called Finchley Lane in the borough of Hendon, which is in North London. I went, I knew that it took place on that street. I didn't have the exact address. I had a police summary, which told me a lot of details, but it was redacted. So there was some elements I didn't wasn't able to see. So I took pictures of every house on both sides of Finchley Lane, which is not a very long street, because I knew it happened in one of these houses. Now, I couldn't use the photograph of the house because somebody lives there. They'd sue me. So I gave it to an artist. I said, render this house as a drawing which is what you're looking at now. And then we took some, the, the foliage at the bottom is from a, a Rousseau painting, the famous French naturalist painter. And the clouds are a stock shot that we purchased for. So it's the idea of the earth. There's a serpent there. Uh, there's the sky with maybe representing freedom or, uh, and then the house with, with these dark windows of a, of a kind of Gothic place. So I think it works pretty good. It does. And all the projects have posters that, that I think stand up. The idea is not to make a poster too busy or too much information, but clean and evocative. And uh, and let the reader, in this case, let the reader make their own pictures, you know? Because right. the mind is the greatest picture maker. Well, uh, the Stairway to the Stars, uh, what you used... I, an artist that comes with our uh, grant donations. Dan um, Chapman, yes. He's one of the top uh, poster makers in the, in America, in my opinion. Carolyn, I love him. So many of yes. his posters have uh, helped films win Academy Awards and win all kinds of awards. He's really talented. Yeah, Dan is, I, I knew Dan's brother, Emmett, uh, and Dan's niece, Diana, uh, for some years. And and then I learned that he was a, a donor on From the Hearts, many donors who help filmmakers who win awards to, to get reduced rates on their services, in his case, graphic design. And uh, yeah, I, uh, I sent him all the photographs we had that were taken on set, uh, kind of, this was based on a Harry Potter poster which I liked very much, which had two profiles of characters 
Daniel Radcliffe and one of the characters staring at each other across a void, you know. And I thought, well, that's a good model for Stairway. And then one of Dan's employees came up with this stairs, which is apparently an AI generated stairway. It's not a real photograph. Because so I said, you know, we need the Hollywood sign in there. I need this shot of them from behind and them staring each other down. So he came up with this. And, you know, we picked the type, the font together. I gave him the log line. And uh, he surprised me with how good it was, you know. Yeah. This is the key thing uh, for everyone on the class. You have to get your vision into one piece of paper, something that we can look at, study, and feel. You can feel this essence. And it creates a desire to know what's the story. That's what you want, right, Lorenzo? What's the story? Yeah, you kind of, you know, the log line helps you. If you took the log line away, it would, you'd still get the idea that it's about antagonists. You know, you've got the racial thing, you've got the age difference. What is this thing about? You know, the, the log line kind of leads you that it's about friendship in the, in the land of dreams uh hollywood you know but uh, yeah so that, there's a collaboration there again with a, with a designer you can't keep these ideas to yourself i mean even orson wells needed help you know exactly and we're not all orson wells so um you need to reach out and bring people into the process and pay them when you can if they're willing to do it for free great but very few people are, can do that now so you have to come up with the dough to move the project forward, it becomes very involved and uh, complicated, but hopefully rewarding, you know? Exactly. Well, thank you, Lorenzo, for sharing all of this. We really appreciate it, so. You're welcome. I have wanted to introduce you to Robert Siegel. He's my personal attorney. He's from the Hearts Attorney. He specializes in industry-related projects, documentaries, features, shorts, webisodes. And uh, so, Robert, we really appreciate you staying on the class all this time. Tell us about appearance releases, what's included in them, and when they should be used. And I believe... They're very important for documentaries, right? Good morning. Yes. Hi there. Hi, folks. Um, so let's take a look at the first slide. Now, again, just in general, the reason for releases, um, I, I we're going to discuss that, but sometimes you know, they're not necessarily very limited reasons. So, like, if they're like interviews, journalistic endeavors, you know, basically because of the First Amendment. Uh, generally, you'll notice like news stories that are done you usually don't go to, you know, people and ask them to sign releases when they do newspaper articles, magazine articles, you know, um, segments for television news. Yeah, they usually because they like they like hot news, and it's been kind of accepted that you, you don't really need the releases, you know, as much for that. So once it's no longer hot news and you're using it for documentaries and longer form projects, you really should be getting releases uh, themselves. That's why, and, and usually at that point, you know, distributors, underwriters, exhibitors are going to want that. And, you know, to also avoid subsequent disagreements about the scope and the type of, you know, uses for the releases, um, you know, for the projects. And also, if there are any like spin-off projects or derivatives of those projects, you know, whether they're fictional or you know, book, whatever, whatever. So, what is a talent release? Again, talent releases are really for narratives. You know, releases are releases in terms of forms. And but a talent, if you, you obtain it, you know, it's the document designed to prevent. You, you know, get you as a producer and your distributors and exhibitors, et cetera, the licensees from getting sued for unauthorized use of, you know, a subject's image or an, a performer's image or voice. It authorizes a production company to distribute the film or project containing, you know, the actor or the subject's name, voice, image, likeness, et cetera. Now, in terms of documentaries, as I said, 
you know, it's, it's not that hot news, you know, article. It's a documentary, whether it's a documentary short or a long form. You know, you should be getting, again, preferably a written release that's signed. We'll talk about the few occasions where that may, you know, may not be possible, which is always very problematical, especially getting errors in omission insurance. Now, these appearance releases can take many forms and they're tailored to the particular project that's being made. Um, and they usually, in general, have certain provisions, like the authorization to record the participant, to use the recording and other material about the participants. A lot of times the participants have, you know, uh, materials like films and photos and things like that in one or more productions. Um, and, you know, you have to haggle sometimes, is it just for this one production or is it beyond that and so forth? And, again, you want to have it also include advertising and promotion in all media and in perpetuity, you know, such as trailers, you know, because that's what's going to be needed for your licensees like distributors, exhibitors, et cetera. Uh, you want a statement. You know, again, the issue of compensation and documentaries is always, kind of problematical uh, and you it, sometimes it, you know again like for public TV they don't want you if you use it you can you're not going to really be able to put it on the air it gets again problematical but in this day and age when subjects can be involved in the project for a long time you have to find some kind of precarious balance where maybe you give them you know uh, a materials release for the use of their materials, um, or you know, you know, th- you know, things like that. Um, maybe as a consultant. I mean, then you know, you kind of again, you know, uh, if you if you're doing like a project for like you know, for like Netflix or for other places, and this is public TV, you get there's a little more flexibility in the matter. <laughs> I mean. Uh, although, you know, journalistically, you try to stay as far away as possible. Sometimes you may not be giving, you, know, you may not be paying your your subject uh, or any participant, you know, out of a budget, but you might give them a back-end participation if there were to be any profit, you know, et cetera. That's another way of doing it. Um, or there may be no compensation at all. Again, it, it varies. Also, a provision that the producer owns the recordings, you know, audiovisual, in which the participant appears and any contributions to the production that may be paid by the participant. So it could be considered even like a work for hire um, or rights that are being assigned. Uh, a release of claims in favor of the producer. That's the most fundamental reason why you get releases. So you can't be sued for defamation or invasion of privacy, uh, uh, basically you know, issues of rights of publicity, et cetera, um, which we'll probably be discussing more in another class down the road. Uh, and of course, a choice of law and venue for the producer's preferred jurisdiction. Again, you try your best to usually have it where the producer is located and you know, even because you may be going to participants that are like all over, you know, the state, the country, all the world. So you try to keep it, if possible, uh, and really try to do it within where the production company is based. Uh, the next slide. Some appearance releases can go further, as I touched on a moment ago, such as authorizing the producer to make a recreation, a dramatic sequence, portraying the participants. Fictionalizing events involving the participant, which of course it gets to be kind of controversial at times, or to use the material authorized under the release in maybe a book or a scripted feature film, and how I mean we have a whole you know we have to deal with the whole issue of what happens if a documentary becomes a fiction project. I mean, then how do you compensate the the participant? You don't have that journalistic aspect to contend with that you did with uh, compensating uh, participants. That's a whole separate issue. Um, um, Basically, uh, let's see, books and derivatives. And again, 
while a producer might think to include these provisions just in case, and, and they should be addressed because these scenarios are all possible. Obviously, they make these releases a little more complicated until they're almost like, you know, access agreements uh, or their life story rights agreements. Uh, and again, uh, a life story right agreement is re- has its key component is a release. Sometimes you know you don't you don't get you know you don't get the the rights to the person's life, especially for a documentary. It may be problematic. Or people may get nervous about it. That's why we sometimes we call them appearance releases or access releases. Um. So. Again, there might be some qualms, and you have to deal with them and do an assessment whether or not this is going to work for the benefit of the project uh, as well. So, in order for a producer to get, you know, have that sign release successful, and without well, minimizing the negotiations, even though there may be some, it's wise to include provisions like these only when they're needed, and you have to really do an assessment because. It's easy to get them all up front than have to go back and say, oh, yeah, you know, we got an interest in the fiction project. And again, what will happen is like a studio or production company will do a fiction project and they'll do it without and they'll try to steer clear of your documentary so they don't have to involve you or compensate you. So that's a whole separate issue. Going to the next slide, why might documentary producers obtain parents' releases even though they don't have to? Again, um, we'll get. To, we'll talk about you know whether or not you know can a verbal one be sufficient. It's better than no release, but written is preferable. It's usually where the underwriters, when you're getting errors and omission insurance, uh, the E and O insurance covers the producers in the event of a claim that they didn't properly obtain any necessary permissions from people appearing in the production. The E&O carriers may require releases as a condition of coverage as a risk reduction measure. Exhibitors, you know, again, studios, television networks, they're all going to want these type of releases as well. So part and parcel of delivery. The extent of these requirements may not be known in advance. You know, you don't know where your, your distribution is going to be. So it's wise to obtain releases during the production when the participants are in close contact, you know, with you. You don't want to lose touch or they disappear off the face of the earth, and then it becomes really, really difficult. Ask you for a release after an interview. As I said, it's a release. Sometimes people assume that release, which is a a risk, and it's quite a risk, basically. Sometimes they want, you know, the subjects want to see how how the, you know, the uh, interview is going to appear in the film. Again, you know, what happens if they don't like it? Then basically you just, Kind of waste a lot of time and money, so you know don't do that. You know you try to steer clear of that as much as possible. Um, reducing defense costs, even though a signed release doesn't guarantee that no one will bring a legal action for the use of the image, uh, but even though they'll be limited if they've signed releases saying they're not going to do it, bring a law lawsuit. Most parents releases contain a provision releasing the producer from the claims brought by that participant. That's the reason why you have a release. It's from this provision. And an appearance release lends strong support to a producer's motion to dismiss a claim. Hey, we have a release. It may reduce the lawsuit defense costs substantially if they try to say, well, the release didn't address this or didn't address that accordingly. Uh, Moving on to the next slide. You try to avoid misunderstandings. The participant may contend that she appeared on camera in, or he, on, uh, you know, in reliance on representation that later turned out to be false. It may not be. That may be their claim. This is a documentary we distributed only in a certain manner or a certain territory. That's why you do it any and all media throughout the world or the universe in perpetuity. You don't put, put limitations on yourself. A typical release includes the participant's agreement to the use of the appearance, and as I said, in you know, all media and perpetuity without restrictions. It reduces the likelihood of an objection based on a misunderstanding. When a performance is involved, by showing a recorded performance, such as the band's rendition of a song, 
you know, they, or a dancer's routine or something, a producer is potentially affecting the market that performance services. That's why it's very difficult. With, you know, if you're going to do record performances, you make it very, very brief because you're basically uh, dealing with that. It was a case called Z- Zucchini, and it was about a man being shot out of a cannon. The problem is once you record the picture of, uh, you know, the performance of someone being shot out of a cannon, that's it. You've recorded the performance. It's over, you know, and, and you're using it, and that kind of weakens the marketplace for people going to see the performance of someone being shot out of a cannon. Um, again, when because you're dealing with music, you know, you know, you may have to go get the synchronization rights or, you know, uh, basically uh, the right to use the composition in sync with your project, you know, your documentary or your narrative. Um, again, then, yeah, you, there might be circumstances where fair use or incidental capture is being done, br- you know, briefly, or you couldn't get a, you know, you, the only way you can feature the person in the project was to use the song. But then these are all kinds of defenses to uh, issues of claims regarding infringement, and you, you know, you don't want to go down that road unless you have like fair use opinions that can be justified, especially when you're trying to get from an underwriter errors and omission insurance. The U.S. Supreme Court has held that the First Amendment doesn't necessarily extend to the broadcast of a performance absent the performance permission. You know, again, unless you can find and follow the narrow parameters of fair use and have that fair use opinion from an attorney and you're following the process and we've discussed fair use about being very limited and being transformational, uh, not just showing it for the sake of showing it because it's cool, you know, uh, that you're speaking or commenting or criticizing or illustrating. Um, Moving on to the next slide, which is can an on-camera verbal release substitute for a written release? Saying a written release, as I stated, is a best practice for a number of reasons likely be more detailed and therefore more protective of the producer than an on-camera verbal release. Michael Moore used to, you know, do them at the very beginning of his career. Uh, Frederick Wiseman did, to, you know, because it was better than nothing. Second, it'll conform to the requirements of insurance, distributors, and others that written releases should be obtained. They, you know, they have to be con- convinced to accept the verbal release and Again, they may and they may not, or they may increase your premium, or they may, you know, there may be a deductible, or they may just exclude the verbal releases, and it becomes your your coverage is like Swiss cheese. Some interview subjects, however, may consider signing a release kind of, quote, beneath their station, like if it's a high-ranking political figure. Um, they might be nervous about signing a legal document without careful reading or getting legal advice. Sometimes they already have counsel, some simply might be contrary to the nature. Under any circumstance in which a prospective releaser refuses to sign a written release, a well-considered verbal release is better than nothing, but you do carry risks. And again, there's some states that want written releases, and that makes it a little more problematical. A verbal release should cover at least the most basic elements of a written release, and the simplest procedure is for the production team member to read the release with sound and video rolling, and ask the interview subject to acknowledge the terms on camera. Those basic elements should include the purpose of the interview, where the interview will be used initially, or you know, in all media and all that, um, as well as advertising promotion, and that the completed work it appears may be shown in all media, et cetera, and worldwide and in perpetuity. And if getting an interview subject to acknowledge all that is it's a problem. The next best approach is for a production team member to read with the camera rolling so that the key information in the form of a notification rather than a request is stated. Like before we begin, let me reiterate that this interview will be used for, et cetera, so that basically you're saying it and not the subject. You know, there's different ways of going about it. You know, also, like when you know, sometimes in crowds, you have like crowd releases, like posters and all that. It's not as good as getting written releases, but sometimes you can't do that. Uh, and 
And again, a crowd, if it's in public, you don't even need a release. There's no expectation of privacy, generally. Moving on, I think this is the last of the slides. Of course, if an interview subject refuses to sign a release before an interview begins, it doesn't mean that the, that he or she uh, won't sign immediately after it asked. He or she may need to know how the interview goes. I mean, I had that basically with, uh, it was about a very famous uh, film, and the lead actress really wanted to see it. And again, it was, it was either that or we had, couldn't use her or so forth, so they had to do that, and the release was after the fact. I wasn't involved in the project until like the 11th hour, so we had to kind of make it work, and we, and we eventually did. Sometimes you may be required to obtain talent releases from individuals appearing on camera. At the same time, in other cases, you might need to secure location permissions uh, if it's really like recognizable locations, it's private property, if it's public, less so, even though you might need a permit, or even life rights consent if you're dealing with famous figures or you're really featuring people on, you know, not just in a brief interview, but they're practically the subject of the film or a key part of it. And life story rights and appearance releases, appearance access releases, that's kind of a, kind of a real offshoot for the uh, basic release. I think that, that's it for the slides, unless there are any questions. No Hello? questions in the chat yet. Anyone has one, please go ahead and put it in the chat. I was gonna jump in. Uh, can Robert hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, I mean, I'm listening to, to all this detail and I've, I've been down that road and I think it's great information um a lot of these releases you get and then they sit in your files and never never are seen again but it's better to have them than not have them it's a kind of clerical aspect of filmmaking that's sort of dry and not all that interesting but if if it doesn't have it if you don't have it and you're asked for it uh you're gonna be sorry you didn't get it um this whole question of eno insurance indemnifying distributors from any potential action that could come. You've been there on the front lines of that, I'm sure. Um, early days, I had no idea about this stuff. I became aware of it later, music rights included. I used to just drop the needle on a record and put it in the movie and hope for the best. Yeah. Now it's different, you know. Um, there's algorithms out there that'll pluck out a uh, an uncopyrighted piece even if it's copyrighted you've got to prove you have it so um legally i'm sure you confirm this it's a minefield out there it it, it is and, and again it it's become a lot more sophisticated you know especially when you're dealing with the uh, you know the studios and the netflixes and the and the amazons of the world basically these corporate you know entities and they're going to basically you know they're going to want this, and again, a lot of times, as deliberately, they'll say all your legal documents, and that includes your releases, and that's part of your, you know, your, your delivery schedule. Yeah, it's easy to be scared by that stuff, but at the same time, if you have expert help, like from Robert, um, it can help you navigate that. Very important. This is so okay. important. Thank you. I mean, you can really get in trouble. I'm the one that hears all the horror stories. Uh, it was my cousin, and now they don't want me to finish the film, or now they want a money. They want a lot of money. Uh, so it's there's something about when you people think you're making a movie that you're going to become so wealthy. You are, and they're not. So uh, it's important in the very beginning before you even turn on the camera to get all your releases. Yeah, get, get, also, a lot of times you get people who participate in a project and they get a, a form of buyer's remorse where they don't want to be interviewed. And then you have, you, you have this written, you know, release. So basically they're locked in. A lot of times we try to put in that these releases are not rescindable or irrevocable so that people don't put the, get the idea in their head that they, 
they're going to get, as I said, buyer's remorse, and they're going to want to say, no, I don't want you to use it. It's like I spent the time and the money, you know, and, you know, and the effort and all of that, and I can't just junk the release and make, I may have to junk the project, and I'm not going to do that. So that's another reason for the written releases, especially if you state that they're not replicable. Exactly. Well, we really appreciate the time that you take and by donating your time to From the Heart to share this information. All of us, thank you very much, Robert. We have time for a few questions, Carol? Sure. Okay. Uh, we have a couple questions from more. Um, the first part is, if you're doing a video for YouTube, are there any differences in the legality for what you need for releases or any special considerations? No. <laughs> you have basically, yeah, YouTube, it's just another medium. You know, the same rules apply. You know, basically, just because something's on YouTube, you know, you still got to go through the whole process of getting releases. You don't get them, you're going to get takedown notices, you know, basically, from YouTube or other, uh, other carriers. So just, you know, that's just the medium. Don't, you know, it's the fundamentals still apply. Terrific. Um, they're asking about uh, a course that they filmed. Um, do they need separate releases if they want to release that course in the future? Do they need a release from the studio? Do they need different types of releases from the students versus the instructor? Well, I mean, basically, you know, if you're if it's just being done internally archivally, it's one thing. But if you sign to put it like online and they're giving some wider dissemination, yes. Again, the the people that you know appear in you know, you know, in in the you know, in the class or students or instructors, you gotta you know, you do gotta get releases. You know, a lot of times when you know, when we do these um you know, a lot of times when you, you do like the classes and the webinars, you know, you generally have to um there are releases signed. Um in order to you know to do that, I mean, um, as part as part of the, part of the process, you know, uh, I'm like uh, a lot of times, like I'll do these uh, like webinars or you know basically or, or 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 even audio or video recorded you know classes like for like bar associations, you know, the people who are involved they have to sign releases. Right. Thank you, Robert. Okay. No questions at this time. Okay, very good. Thank you, Robert, for your kindness. And thank you so much, Lorenzo, for sharing your ideas and your production experience with us. And I want to say about uh, Branwyn Edwards in the chat bar. She said, Lynn McTaggart talks about the power of eight and maybe we can get a group of eight people to intend together work on Lorenzo's production. And that's a great idea. And I think anyone who would like to work on a power of eight class, uh, email me. I interviewed Lynn McTarget when that book came out. So I have to go back and get my recording and we can listen to it because as I remember, she said that those people who were meeting together to intend for something uh, were actually the recipients of many wonderful things happened in their lives because they were uh, giving unselfishly their uh, help to other people. So it paid off in the long run. So if you're interested, please email me. And thank you so much for joining the class. We'll see you next time with Safety and Wrap. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Lorenzo. And thank you very much, Bob. Thank you. Happy to be here. Take care. Yeah. Okay. Take care. Bye. Thank you.